government work is pretty cool, but I never expected someone to want to start a prank war with us. Yeah, did you see that John guy put all my desk supplies in jello? That guy's a real comedian. It's fine. He wanted to up the ante, so wait until you see what I did. Jamie, don't go. I need... Did, did, did you lock him in the intrinsic field generator? No, I put his watch in there. I thought it would give him a little scare. It sounds like we're getting fired. Yeah, Jake. Uh, sure seems like we're going to get fired for that uh, murder. But it was just a watch, man. <laughs> get it? Watchman. Watch man. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's Super Sons. Yeah, we really should record that. That would be Yeah. I it's mean fine. Yeah. So today I can only cringe so many times. <laughs> so today we are watching the Watchmen. And uh Heck, ho, oh, oh. ho. But we are not alone. We have brought in a comic book expert, uh, Sam. Hello, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. We're very excited to have you. Should I do a little little intro, tell people who I am? Yeah, let the <laughs> um, know. I'm Samantha Puck. I'm the managing editor at The Beat, and I mostly write about like LGBTQ and fat representation in fiction, so I have a lot of feelings about The Watchmen. And um, this is the one I was saving. Uh, we are the first podcast to be double pucked. Um <laughs> Sam's, Sam's uh, partner, what Reed, the has, fuck, Dan? <laughs> has been on the show before. I messaged okay. to Reed the other day. I was like, hey, <laughs> I just want to let you know this, this is this is in my head and I cannot get it out. Oh, no, I, I respect it. I totally understand. Yeah, so we uh, Sam wrote an essay for Shelf Dust on, ish, is it issue nine? Yes, I wrote about issue number issue nine. nine. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post those Shelf Dust articles in this episode description just so you guys can read those um it's a very very good series of essays yes so watchmen uh today's show we're not going to be getting super into the summary of the story uh, i'm sorry for that if you really want to know everything about the watchmen i suggest watching the movie maybe or reading it um just be warned. I wanted to give some content warnings before this episode because Watchmen is uh, a lot. So there's content warnings for sexual assault, slurs, general violence, emotional, physical, and mental abuse. Um, this book is, would you say it's heralded as like one of the biggest comics of all time? Yeah. It's big. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's it it, came it, out of, it it changed comics, not in the way that I think. According to Grant, uh, not fuck Alan Moore, <laughs> that he uh, that he how he wanted it to change comics, but it definitely changed comics. Yeah, um, it's got a lot. Um, yeah, but that's why we brought Sam so we can get some better perspective on it. Um, and more insight into the lasting effects and things like that. So Jake and I are going to do a quick summary, um, a little bit, de- a little bit of debriefing about the world. Um, Watchmen was written by Alan Moore. The art was by Dave Gibbons and the colors were by, I didn't write this down. Um, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't write down any of the creative team. Um, but the colorist is John Higgins. Um, I feel like he gets left out a lot, um, but that's just the way it goes. So, Watchmen. Everything has gone to shit. Utter shit. The Cold War is locked in a stalemate until the year 1985, where our story takes place. Richard Nixon is still president after removing term limits. The days of the masked adventurers have long since 
since passed after the Keene Act outlawed masked vigilantism. None of it really mattered after Dr. Manhattan arrived on the scene. With the powers of the god, the powers of a god, no one stood a chance in the face of his blue dick, which has a huge presence in the story. It's a lot. Watchmen is a lot. So, uh, Jake, let's start this kind of bulleted quick summary. All right. A comedian is murdered in New York City. Rorschach investigates and believes that there's someone knocking off masks. I like how it says knowing off masks. Mm-hmm. I already read it. Don't change it. <laughs> but, uh, we learn about the group, the first costume super, uh, costume heroes from Hollis Mason, who was the OG night owl. Turns out the comedian is a fucking monster and good riddance. He were, also worked for the government after heroes are outlawed, so he kind of got to stay around. Uh, Rorschach breaks into Dan's, Dan's the, the second night owl's house, eats his beans and warns him, but he's also like, is like, you quit, you little bitch. Basically, he's telling him that someone's going around. He also people. accuses him. Yeah. He accuses everyone of everything. Yeah. He, Rorschach goes to Warren Vite, the former hero, Ozymandias. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Ozymandias. Hey, I did it right. Mm-hmm. Who's the smartest man in the world? He built a big old business and isn't afraid of. Knock, uh, of someone knocking off old adventures. What? Oh. He isn't afraid of someone coming to kill him. They also call yeah. themselves adventurers in this book a lot and not superheroes. I mean, before they called themselves superheroes, they were um, mystery men. Mm-hmm. Um, he also has action figures of himself. But anyway, uh, Rorschach goes to warn Dr. Manhattan, who is like a god and always has dong out. Uh, and we meet uh, Silk Spectre number two, Lori, uh, who goes to dinner with Dan. We learn about how the world has changed since Dr. Manhattan came onto the scene and how the world is on the verge of war. Hmm. Rorschach goes to a former villain, Mullock's house, uh, who was visited, the comedian be- visited by the comedian before his death. He has cancer and says it's not the type you get better from. Lori leaves John because he doesn't give a single goddamn fuck about anything because he is a monster. John finds out his former friends and wife, uh, former wife, had cancer that he supposedly gave them. Someone tries to murder Vite, but they eat a cyanide capsule and die. Rorschach is framed for murder. When he goes back to Mullock's, Mullock's bodies, um, he got capped, and Rorschach fights the police, but he is arrested. Laurie and Dan have a growing closer, and they hook up, but um, there's a, a, a side story where Dan can't get it up. I didn't know if we really need to talk about this. Did Alan Moore really need to write this? I'll be honest and say I've never been interested in how well superheroes can perform sexually after their heyday, but hey, whatever the, wiz- the wizard writes is law, I guess. At least he isn't uh, a Nazi like everyone else. Fuck. He's just a sad sack in the story. Laurie and Dan suit up and go to the superhero thing where they save people from a burning building. And then they go to the bone zone way up on high in Archimedes, his kind of bat plane. We learn Rorschach's backstory, which is horrific and that he doesn't think that he is Walter Kovacs anymore. Um, He's sort of given up that life and believes Rorschach is who he really is. He believes that is his skin. Um, They escape. And Dan and Lori break Rorschach out of prison. Um, they break out murder out of prison. Um, John pops in and Lori has to convince him to come back to Earth to save them from whatever is coming. Um, John sees everything all at once. He sees the past, present, and future all in one thing. Um, they find out that Vite is actually behind whatever is coming. And Dan and Rorschach go to his palace in antarctica he's sort of obsessed with um egyptian ideologies and ozymandias and alexander the great and he's got all this weird stuff built up there um 
And it turns out he's taken all of the scientists and artists and anyone who can create something on Earth, and they've been creating a um, a giant, a big old squiddly squiddly is what Jake wrote. Um, they took the brain of a psychic, someone who actually did have powers and basically cloned it and made it super big. So the only problem is that the thing keeps exploding and killing everyone around it. So he's planning to drop it into the middle of New York City. Um, Dan and Rorschach find this out and they try to stop him. They do the whole hero thing and he just monologues for a bit and tells them how this will unite the Earth. This will stop the Cold War because everyone's going to see they have a villain outside of each other. Um, Like he... He is so warped that he believes he's the good guy here. He uses something that Dr. Manhattan created to teleport the monster into the middle of New York City and kills over half of New York in a heartbeat. So while Dan and Rorschach are trying to stop Ozymandias, um, they're both like, you can never do this. We'll never let you get away with this. And Ozymandias says something along the lines of, what do you think? I'm a Republican pulp um, pulp novel villain i did it 35 minutes ago so all of the destruction had already taken place um by the time this scene is even going on and i think that toys a little bit with the whole time thing that this whole story has floating through it um there's a lot of jumping between time periods mostly because john is in all places at once or some bullshit uh Light basically traps people into the um, ultimatum that either they tell the truth and out him for what he did, or and they lose all the peace on Earth, or they be quiet and people have something to unify over, and the Earth can quote unquote heal. Um, everyone pretty much agrees, including John, except Rorschach, who says um, never. He's basically like, nah, fuck that. I'm not dealing with this. He says, uh, never something, whatever. It doesn't matter. Rorschach sucks. Um, and so Rorschach walks out. He's walking through Antarctica. John shows up, vibe checks him, blows him up. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, Rorschach actually sent his journal to a um, right wing journal, uh, right wing magazine so they could publish it. Um, he says that Vite pretty much is behind whatever's going to happen. Uh, John leaves Earth because he's disillusioned with the human condition. Uh, Dan and Lori go into hiding, and Vite went on to, you know, kill Mufasa or something. Oh. Um, that's the end of our summary. Uh, I, I don't want people to think that we're, like, trashing Watchmen, because, like, it it, it changed everything, but looking at the story now how characters are treated how um it's got a lot of heavy stuff and that is exactly why we brought sam because jake and i um needed needed someone to uh help us out with that yeah so sam was kind enough to supply us with some talking points and Sam, are you ready? Yeah, I also just want to note that um, I, I did discuss Watchmen talking points with a friend of mine mm-hmm. who is not in like the online comics community, but is very, very smart and has thought quite a lot about the issues that Watchmen represents. So I just want to give her credit for that. Her name is Sadie, um, and she knows a lot about a lot, and her opinions about comics are always really interesting. So someday, someday I'll get her to to do something with us yeah i <laughs> i only knew sadie through osmosis so yes yes the osmosis of sadie that's <laughs> that's it yeah so. yeah I, i'm osmosis jones yeah, yep. very thank very thankful you are here um thank you i'm glad that you invited me on i'm actually yeah. very excited about this so yeah. jake and i uh, we, we have insight and stuff but we want um, perspectives that are not our own. I went after the Watchmen show came out. I was like, oh man, I wonder if there's any, you know, Watchmen podcasts. And you know, it's a thousand um, white guys spurting their opinions about Watchmen. And I was like, mm, I don't need more of that. So. I'm so sorry. I just completely lost you. I have no idea what you said. 
It's okay. I was talking about how there's a thousand Watchmen podcasts with two cis white men giving their opinions on Watchmen. I was like, you know, oh. what? I don't, I don't really want to have that again. <laughs> that does seem to be the recurring trend, um, which was why I was really kind of glad and relieved that Steve Morris, when he commissioned pieces for the the Watchmen series that he ran on Shelf Dust, he was very specifically like, I do not want cisgender men to write about this, mm-hmm. um, which I thought was cool because it offered different perspectives on some of the issues that it covers. Yeah, absolutely. And it yeah. seems like a lot of straight white men are really mad about the show making Rorschach an, a Nazi icon. Um, I... Th- Vic Sage, Vic Sage said it best. Rorschach sucks. He does. Yes. He Rorschach, sucks a lot. Rorschach is the fucking... Like, even opening the book for the first few pages, I'm like, holy shit. Like, when, uh, like when I was younger, I was like, oh, Rorschach's so cool. And now that I'm like, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. He's yeah, awful. I, we, you and I talked about this a few months ago. Like, yeah... Rorschach really isn't, I mean, he's supposed to be, like, intimidating, but he's not either. It's weird. He also, he has to smell. Yeah, he does. That's something. He does, that's directly stated. Yeah. Also, so. I want to say one thing before we actually get into this, because I don't want to cut Sam off. But, so, how does no one realize that White literally shoves a cyanide capsule in that man's mouth? Um... You know, it's not every day you watch someone push their hand into a stranger's mouth. Um, I would probably be a little bit taken about back by that and the fact that someone just tried to shoot my boss. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have no comment on that. It's the, I just it's the, like... it's the weirdest, like, visual, like, a visual of murder that I'm like, wow. But he's going to get away with that. <laughs> Yeah. All right, I'm I'm done on that tangent. Well, he's a rich white businessman in America, so mm-hmm. this you is know how true. it seems to go for them. Yeah. Uh, very similar to a, a certain comment about how um, someone could shoot someone dead in the middle of Fifth Avenue and couldn't be touched. So yeah, you know, some interesting uh-huh. parallels there for sure. Before we get into the talking points, I, something similar to that. At one point, um, Rorschach tells the story that talks about the bystander effect where everyone just kind of watches something happen and hopes someone else will do something about it, but they never do. Um, and like yeah. horrific things happen because people are just apathetic. Um, the, the, like the one, I don't want to like just completely shit. I want to put one positive thing in, in the end, as you are realizing the alien is about to come, um, someone's in a fight and like people come in to break it up. Just something little like that. I saw, um, I was like, oh, okay. And then it's like, kind of like, oh, they could be redeemed, but then, you know, they get a giant squid dropped on them. Yeah, it's that question of being an active bystander, watching something happen versus stepping in when something is occurring, which I think is also, um, like, Rorschach doesn't approach it from this perspective, but there's definitely a question of privilege there because, like, if you are, you know, a cisgender heterosexual white guy, then you certainly have the ability to step in when something like that is happening versus if you are, um, you know, a disabled person of color, like that's not, you don't have the same ability and you're probably also not going to be taken seriously and could potentially put yourself in danger, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's, this, this, like, Mr. Miracle was a really hard episode to do for us because it's, like, in a really emotional book. This episode is hard to do because, like, I just want to scream. Mm. Uh, yeah. So. I we- will say, just on that note, like, that I read Watchmen in college because I wanted to impress a boy that I liked, which is, you know. That's kind of, I feel like that's so many people's stories of like how they read Watchmen or why they read Watchmen. Um, And I, at the time I was like, oh, like this is really weird and like kind of funky and like, it's not like anything that I've ever read. And then I reread it earlier this year to work on that essay for Shelf Dust. And the, the, 
the difference of perspective between like I'm reading this for the first time and I'm reading this again and seeing all of the issues that are inherent in it is really interesting. And I kind of wish that more people would reread it after they've learned a little bit more about the world Mm. and see how it makes them feel because I think it becomes more uncomfortable kind of the more that you know. But I'm also saying that as a person who comes from a marginalized group. So like I'm, I'm more hyper aware of those issues now than I was you know, a decade ago. Yeah. I, I, it was a lot different for me reading it this time than I was. Cause I, the first time I read this was in, uh, I think middle school. Uh, oh God. That's yeah. so young to read Watchmen too. Oh yeah. yeah I've read a lot of, like, I read, uh, kingdom come in like the f- fourth grade. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. A lot of heavy religious tones in that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I was talking to my coworker about it cause he's watching the show and he was telling me that he, he was reading it when it came out and he was like, back then I was like, man, this, this Rorschach fella, he's really cool. Like he's a cool character. And he's like, now that I'm an adult, I'm like, holy shit, fuck that guy. So it's nice to know that it's not just <laughs> everyone kind of gets that Rorschach as a piece of shit, except like ninth graders. A lot, and people with the maturity of ninth graders mm-hmm. don't want to. Yeah. There's definitely a contingent of people who are still like huge Rorschach fans, and those are the people that I can't talk about Watchmen with because I know that it's going to end poorly. Oh yeah, so, yeah. Hmm. Oh, I mean, oh. uh, this guy eats beans just straight. Like he doesn't doesn't warm them up. Just goes breaks into people's houses, eats their food. Um, that should be the first time that he's a but, sociopath, right? But, yeah. But also, <laughs> what the like, fuck? he goes out of his way to ruin a man's life. And it, which is even sadder because in the most recent, uh, what was it? Um, Doomsday Clock, doesn't his son become the next Rorschach? Oh, yeah. I, that, there's a lot of controversy around Watchmen, its treatment by DC Comics, Alan Moore, and all that stuff. Um, I don't, I don't have a ton of background knowledge on it, so I don't want to talk about it directly, but what? Who the fuck was like, oh, yeah, you know what this story really needs? A sequel. You know who should be in it, though? <laughs> Superman. He's great. Let's ruin that. <laughs> All I would like when I went through and read the question, like, yeah, he he reads uh, Vic Sage reads it on a plane. And he's like, hmm, tries to reenact some of the fight scenes and it gets his ass kicked. It's like, oh, Rorschach sucks. Yeah, like, uh, that's all I needed from that. That's the only thing I would want after read like more. Of it. That's the only is you know. I, yeah, I, it's enough. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. Please stop. I agree. I think that it's enough. <laughs> yeah, I like pretty much everything. Like, because if you take it too seriously, like you're gonna be like, oh yeah, let's get a new sequel. The sequel is gonna be tone deaf. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I. I got to say, I'm enjoying the show. I know a lot of people aren't watching it, but um, it, I want to know more about the writer's room before I speak on any of the themes of it. But yeah, it's it's uh, not. How many episodes has it been so far? Three. But yeah, let's get to um, these talking points. I also named this section on the script at Let's Talk About Watchmen. Um, should be a hashtag. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. <clears throat> Number Check one. Sense. How Watchmen does or doesn't dismantle the superheroes are perfect trope. So this yeah. is like the whole point of Watchmen, right? Was <laughs> that he wanted to show you that, you know, superhero people are still people and people are still, I think in Alan, Moore, in Alan Moore's mind, people are fundamentally bad. That's yeah. kind of the, the thing that I get from his writing. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, yeah, this... I, it feels like this... Like, I know Dr. Manhattan is supposed to be Captain Adam, but it feels like he's supposed to be their Superman. Um, oh. And it's just like... Someone given those powers and they decide to turn away from humanity while... Uh, Big Blue was raised as a human and is just a beacon of hope for everyone. It came in like a darker time in the world, but I don't know. It's just seeing it's not even the fact that they're not they're not perfect. It's not like he's making them, quote unquote, flawed 
He's just making them into monsters. I'm so sorry. You cut out again. I heard it's not even the fact that they're not perfect and then nothing. It's not the fact that they're not perfect. It's that he's turned them all into monsters. Mm. What are your thoughts? Also that, I think that that's an interesting take on it. I also think that there is some question of how... Like, when we talk about, you know, morality and good and evil, and when we talk about superheroes, when we talk about supervillains, when we talk about even just regular people, um, there is a line between you are a person who does bad things and you are a bad person, and I think that it can be easy to cross that line if you're not, like, self-aware. And I think that the characters that more created for this series don't have self-awareness and so they come off as monstrous because there's less focus on what I'm doing is bad and I should reflect on that and more on I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing because this is what I know how to do does that make sense yeah yeah and I don't know I think I think in one so I think that the one thing that this series actually does do well is that it does kind of play with the concept of like villainy and heroism and how those things can be very (sighs) tightly interwoven in ways that are often very uncomfortable and in ways that we don't want to talk about. Um, But I also think that in doing that more relies so heavily on things that are just inherently violent in and of themselves and don't necessarily need to be present in order to show that kind of thematic element Mm -hmm. that it gets like, it's kind of a wash. You know what I mean? Like the, the good thing about Watchmen ends up getting wiped out by all of the bad things about Watchmen. Yeah. It kind of like turns neutral because you're like, well, you got this, but then you got that. Yeah, and it's one of those things where it's like, cool, you did this one story element well, but then everything else is so terrible that, like, why would I read this book about this when I could read, you know, um, like, for example, I could read a Punisher comic where he murders a bunch of people, but he also allies himself with women and queer people who are victims of violence, you know? Like, give me, if you want to give me a character who's very much invested in quote quote doing heroic acts but in a way that's not necessarily heroic do it in a way that's better (laughs) i'm so happy you're here (laughs) (laughs) thanks (laughs) um yeah it's like someone like i i asked you the other day i was like do you think dan the character like night owl is now that I'm, you mentioned the he's not bad, but he does bad things. Um, it's yeah, the fact that he has ITM. Yeah, uh, he has this basement full of. He has his back cave. He's got all of this stuff, and he just like I, that. It all is so perplexing. It's like he's got all this stuff, but he still has no uh, self worth or anything like that. So he projects it in the worst ways uh but well and he's very expectant Mm -hmm. um which i do think that like going back to your point in the summary about like do we really need to know that this guy like can't get it up during sex i think no that we don't need to know that but on another level like that's such a pervasive idea of masculinity that like if you are a man and if you can you know perform masculinity in the way that you're supposed to then you can you know take this woman that you've had these feelings for all these years and like have really vigorous sex with her and have it not mean anything and it's great and it's fine and Dan can't do that like it's just he doesn't live up to that at all and I think that that's a lot of why he feels so worthless um and like I have a lot of issues with the way that he's written because he feels very much like a character who's just like kind of self insert, you know, guy who feels bad about himself can relate to this character and then blame everything that happens to him. That's bad on the people around him, particularly like the women. Um, But yeah, like there's just, I, I, I do see the value in showing 
sort of that element of his character, but I don't necessarily see the value in having a character like him in a team full of people who are all so atrocious because he's almost atrocious by like, what's the word I'm looking for? Association? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel um, that. Yeah, no, yeah. He's atrocious by association, but then he's also he also has these like very kind of weird and sinister little elements of his own character. And so he doesn't like if you want to talk about toxic masculinity and you want to talk about feelings of worthlessness in relationship to that, okay, cool. But then again, it's one of those things where it's like you've done this one good thing, but the way that it's done is not necessarily the good best. or interesting. Yeah, exactly. Also, the fact that he goes and breaks out, like, I understand Rorschach was his friend, but he's like a straight up murderer and they go and break him out of jail. It's like, whoa, hey there. But like Rorschach was false. Mm, mm, he wasn't falsely put in jail like he is a murderer. But yeah, he, he was just caught doing the, the th- something he didn't do. Yeah. He's done plenty of other bad things. Yeah. Lots of other murders. So this... <laughs> The second one um, I added in was just wanted to talk a little bit about the who watches the watch and metaphor um, and all that jazz. Um, I, I like, I guess that's the whole idea of the book is like, who can stop these powerful people from doing whatever they want? Um, because they, they don't seem to have any consequences in their own minds. Um, Jake, do you have any thoughts on that metaphor? Hmm. I wasn't really prepared for that. <laughs> Sam? Um, so okay. I think that... Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, I think... I also feel like I'm talking a lot, so feel free to cut me off if I'm rambling. But I think that th- that metaphor gets kind of lumped in with the idea of, like, you know, who is the ultimate authority? Like, who is the ultimate good? Who... Uh, is almost like most divine in that sense. So like when we talk about things like authority and things like, uh, you know, the structures that oppress people who are different or who don't fit into a certain ideal norm, we talk about things like, you know, who's watching these power structures, like who's controlling this. So like, for example, like who is overseeing the police who commit brutalities every day, um, who is overseeing, you know, the government who essentially is the ruler of the land. Um, And I think that with the Watchmen, it's like, yes, they are the most powerful people on this, this version of the earth and they can't be stopped, which we see with, you know, with Dr. Manhattan and with that whole plot. But then that question becomes like, if they could be stopped, what would that look like? And how would that come about? Because if you talk about, you know, like anarchist ideals and overthrowing corrupt systems of power, there's a very real sense that the Watchmen are a corrupt system of power, especially Dr. Manhattan, who's just so wildly all powerful that like no one compares, even the people that he was once peers with. Um, But then when you, let's say for example, that you actually do overthrow the Watchmen, you get rid of them, you kill them, you do whatever it is. Then what does the world look like? Because inevitably something or someone is going to take their place. So is it cyclical? Hmm. Nothing ever ends. <laughs> I also think that in general, um, I really appreciated, I'm going to keep talking about this series of essays because I want everybody to read it because I was among some really incredible critics for it. But uh, the fact that Steve named our series of of essays "Women Watch the Watchmen" was really interesting to me because in the Watchmen comic, women are treated so poorly. Yes, and it it yeah, it's just it's a it's a complicated metaphor, I think, and it's one that I think a lot of people misuse in order to kind of try to justify what the Watchmen are doing or how. 
So next up we have <clears throat> <laughs> run of the mill sexism, racism, and other isms as expressed by the characters, including total lack of diversity diversity among the main cast. So correct me if I'm wrong, but all of the characters in the Watchmen are white. Uh, uh, yeah, other than the uh, the doctor, the therapist. Yes. Okay. Which I thought was a good concept that there was a black man in that position because that's like a for for most people that's like a position of power mm, but that character is yeah really, the, that whole thing he did get broken down yeah well i'll also say too that i think that there i think there's this idea that um this i guess this also kind of builds on the who watches the watchman thing but there's this idea that people who are in marginalized positions whether because of their race or their ability level or their health status or their sexuality or their gender or whatever or any intersections thereof are sort of required simply by the fact of their existence to not only be activists for themselves but also activists for the groups that they belong to and then also educators for people who don't come from those groups and so it's hard for me to swallow the fact that the only person of color that we see in this series is in a therapy role because there's very much and this is a misconception about therapy, I think, but there's very much this idea that therapists should be able to fix you or hold you accountable for the things that you're doing wrong. Hmm. And so that very much feeds into that trope of like, this character is supposed to be sort of correcting the actions of fucking awful people. Uh, there, I think. Hmm. Uh, does that make the, sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. The, uh, young person who is reading the black freighter in the book um is also african-american and he's written as like it felt like a like a racist caricature and i was like oh yeah okay alan um I, and correct me if i'm wrong but the only two women i recall in the entire no three the only three women are the ones are silk specter one her mother, her, and John's ex-wife. Mm-hmm. Um, and all three have horrible travesties, like, because of those um, men. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, it's yeah. not great. <laughs> yeah. Um, would you mind speaking to that a little bit? The, the issue with the women? Mm-hmm. Ugh, yeah, okay, so... Um, so obviously there is an inherent like very obvious issue with the fact that Sally's mom is groomed to eventually give in to her rapist and then he fathers her child and that ends up traumatizing her in such a way that she sort of passes that trauma on to her daughter in more ways than one um, and then as she gets older and she starts dating Dr. Manhattan, there's this idea that like, oh, like he's the ultimate man. Like they're, you know, they're perfect together and they love each other and whatever. But like, no, he doesn't really care about her because he doesn't care about humans. And so she ends up in a very similar position where it's like she's been groomed to believe that this is the treatment that she deserves. And so she accepts it until she doesn't. And then when she chooses not to accept it, it nearly ends the world. And so she essentially becomes responsible for his emotions, which is just really, really gross. And then I believe his wife is not actually, or his ex-wife is not actually a character on the page, right? She's just mentioned. Uh, you see her in flashbacks and then um, at the interview, she is there. That's right. Okay. I apologize. It's been several Thanks. months since I reread this again, but, um, and again, it's the same thing. You know, she's she's a victim of a man, and that's how we see her, and that's how she's presented. Yeah. And that's it. Also, Lori is 16 um, mm -hmm. when he goes after her. Mm hmm So, um... Mm hmm Everyone... <laughs> so she's literally... Uh-huh. Uh yeah. Everyone uh -huh. is... <laughs> Everyone is either a pedophile, 
a Nazi or a rapist. And, and it is the, the doctor's friend. Yeah, it's that was oh, bad. That was, oh, yeah. Um, there is so much. Like, oh. Well, and I will say that, like similar to kind of realizing the overall issues in this series when I reread, when I opted to write about issue number nine for the Shelf Dust series, it came from a place of reading Gloria's realization of who her dad is and what that meant about her mom. Reading the kind of victim-blaming cultural shift that she goes through in her head where she's like, well, why would she let him do that to her, which it, it's obviously not her mother's fault. Um, and then also reading her trying to navigate this very dangerous relationship with this much older man put me in this place where it was like, I hate the fact that when I first read this series, I didn't pick up on the grooming elements because I was so indoctrinated at that point into believing that there's two sides to every story and that older men preying upon younger women is totally normal and totally okay and it's not weird and it's not bad. You know what I mean? And so it's like, it's just something that's so, so normalized um, that it becomes pervasive to a point where it's difficult to recognize, let alone talk about or fight against and I think that that is changing a little bit because conversations about sexual assault and sexual harassment are becoming um I don't want to say more mainstream but I can't think of another term right now and more common I guess at the uh, yeah in a way but then at the same time like there's still so much that happens in whisper networks behind the scenes like just I mean just this year I reported on you know, two different predators in the comics industry who were getting work for years, even though people were well aware of their behavior. You know, and Harvey Weinstein just got invited to an, a performance where there were young women present that he easily could have preyed upon, just like he preyed upon dozens of others. You know, so it's like there's a certain extent where it's like, what are the consequences? Are there consequences? Do they exist? And sometimes it feels like the answer is no, and that's very disheartening. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Sorry, I feel like I went a little off topic there no, from Watchmen, no, but this this is uh, this is perspective that needs to be had. Um, so thank you for bringing it. Uh, uh, the next question is a little less um, loaded. The role I just of want time. To say, actually, just before you jump into this question, go ahead. Um, Sadie by Osmosis. <laughs> <laughs> wanted us to talk about the Vietnam War and its impacts on this book because she's very interested in like war history and I had no I have no way of talking about those things and so there was a moment where I just kind of stared at her and said I can't talk about that like I have no idea how to talk about that she was like okay what if you talked about this instead <laughs> so if y'all want to talk about war and how it affects the plot of Watchmen by all means feel free but that's you know yeah. I did not include it in my talking points because it felt like something that I was not equipped to deal with. Yeah. Um, if you if you had, I, I was a history major in college. If you had put that in there, I probably would have had more to say, but I, I would have thought about it more when I was reading. So now I just feel bad. because I, I think the, I, I thought about it a lot because I was thinking about Vietnam, especially because mm -hmm. in the show, Vietnam has been um, annex. Is that the right word? When you add a state, um, Wait, I'm I lost you after I think the I'm so sorry. It's okay. So, um, in the the television show, from what I understand, the fifty one, the fifty first state is Vietnam. Um, so not only did we send pretty much a nuclear weapon, we we took it over. Um, and the fact that we the war was won in this because of a nuclear power. Um, and this, the world is still falling apart at that point is very scary. Like there's, even if quote unquote, the war was won, um, it's never over. Um, the violence never solves anything. 
the whole Vietnam part of this with Dr. Manhattan and the comedian is uh, very rough because um, so they're at a bar after they've won and the comedian is about to leave and a young woman comes up and is like, now that the war is over, we can talk about our child. Um, and he's basically says something along the lines of fuck your country. Um, you guys mean nothing. Um, that child means nothing. And she attacks him, um, to which he shoots her and he kills her and the child while Dr. Manhattan just stands there and watches. Um, so I think that speaks more to his lack of humanity. Yeah. That scene is the whole Vietnam, like people bowing down to him is it's scary. It's also very scary that situation because that very much mirrors a lot of situations, the, the, a lot of the atrocities that happened in Vietnam. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. War not good. Um, I wish we had we had like a better cited sources argument, like discussion for that. But um, the Vietnam War is like it's always lingering in the background of this story, no matter what because the comedian comes back with a huge gash across his face so he wears a leather mask uh-huh. to hide it because his inner scars are now on now on his outside forever um so after that point he's always seen in a mask except at a party and when he's crying on Mullock's bed um and from what I understand, like Mullick seem we don't see all the bad things he did when he was a supervillain, but he's the only character that isn't just outright awful when you meet him. He's just kind of um I don't wanna I don't wanna say broken, but he's just kind of run down. Like he's like, I, I don't do this, like this isn't who I am anymore. I'm trying to make amends for what I did. Um Yeah. Sorry, I went off on the thing there. But yeah, um the comedian wears this gimp mask the rest of the book which is odd they didn't include it in the movie so his face is always perfect just a weird choice um but the role of time travel and destiny (laughs) in telling effective stories about the future so this came from the whole you know dr manhattan sees everything all the time happening at the same time Mm -hmm. past present future it doesn't matter and that very much removes him from humanity in a big way um but i think that it i think i think and i don't want to speak for alan Moore, obviously i think the intention of that is to say like the future is inevitable you can't change it no matter what you do but that feels so wildly defeatist to me yeah um, nihilist is that what it would be yeah I just don't believe that anything matters yeah like yeah. that just there's no like what's the point and that's very much his attitude is like what's the point and then kind of I'm, I'm gonna backtrack a lot while we do this but going back to like the Lori stuff you know he's like i see it all it doesn't matter no matter what happens i already i already know what you're gonna do and she's like okay so then why are you even challenging me with trying to convince you to do better And he says, because you have to, like, it's just very, it's very gross. Like, I don't like the dynamic of, I know everything, I'm omniscient, I'm amazing, and you know nothing, but you're going to do everything that I know you're going to do because you have to, because that's your role. Like, it just, there's no, there's no agency there. Yeah, that whole, the only reason he comes back to save the Earth is because of, um her being born out of a horrible thing um it's it's bad it's bad it's it's bad so much of watchmen can just be kind of broken down to it's bad i know that you said that you don't want to just shit on the comic but like it's bad yeah like i i was trying to read it the other day like reading this was like a slog through the mud and i'm i'm reading it and i i guess for some reason jake's voice was in my head because i was like fuck why is anybody reading this there's books with captain carrot out there oh yeah that's because (laughs) oh i love captain carrot it's just like i i i I get it he's a giant talking bunny yeah i i get that it did stuff but i 
get that but I why can... are we still so obsessed with it now? Like, why is yes. Lindelof so obsessed that he felt like he had to make this series? Yeah. You Especially know, and... since it's, like, according to Alan Moore and what he said, like, a lot of people misinterpreted his intentions in making this book. Accord- yeah. According to him. I don't know where he was at then, where he's at now. On uh, the in a tower of... somewhere. Well, and yeah. you know what? Like, as far as that goes, like, the author is dead. So once the book exists, that's it. The book exists, yeah. and people are going to interpret it how they're going to interpret it. Like, that's... <sighs> That's it's the same problem that I have with J.K. Rowling. Like she just hops on Twitter once a week and she's like, "Oh, and also this." And it's like, "No, the books ended twelve years ago, hey. and this is what was in the books, and that's it. If it's not in, if it's not on the page, it's not canonical. And if you want to tell people that they're misinterpreting your work, then you should have been better about how you created that work so that it could not be misinterpreted." That's why uh, Adam X the Extreme is uh, the third Summers brother. Brother. <laughs> Um, oh my god! I hear about Adam X the Extreme all the time. <laughs> you're welcome. Oh god! Oh god! Uh, it's in hey. there. It's in there really briefly, but it's in there. It's in the hey, canon. S- hey Sam. Yeah. I know you mentioned J.K. Rowling. Um, you're a pretty big Harry Potter fan, right? Yep. Grew up with the books. Um, did did Rowling say something along the lines of the wizards used to just poop on the floor? Yes, that was one of her Twitter things. What? Recently. You went on a were... <laughs> What? This is not about Watchmen, for sure. We can unpack how the wizards just shit themselves wanna... and then magic did away. I... Watchmen... Watchmen feels like a wizard taking a shit on the floor. Yeah, um, but it doesn't I mean, have Alan, to be Alan Moore is a wizard. Alan Moore is a muscled wizard. Yeah. What the fuck? So, it's, it's that, so that's weird because... It's weird for a lot of reasons, but, like, it's primarily weird because, like, why, why, why would you do that? But then, like, there are, there are bathrooms in Harry Potter. (laughs) And there's a whole... There's 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 like, a story, is it there? There's a whole scene where Dumbledore, who's a garbage person, talks... That's my official stance on Dumbledore, by the way. He's a garbage person. Um, Shit, hot take. Where he... Less than... No, not so much, but, you know, whatever. People are going to defend abusers forever, and I just have to accept that at this point. But... There's a scene where he's like, oh, you know, the first time I discovered the room of requirement was because I had to use the bathroom and I found a room full of chamber pots. Chamber pots are still a type of toilet. They're a little bit, you know, obviously not as um, clean as like indoor plumbing. But no. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. The whole they they, they put in their robes and then they magic it away. No, it's not okay. One one more thing. Dumbledore found the room of requirement because he needed to take a shit. He had to. I think he said that he had to pee. Well, he didn't say he had to pee because nobody says things like that in you know, Harry you... Potter books. But yeah, he was like, "Oh, I found a room full of chamber pots." Hey, y'all, gotta go take a piss, BRB. <laughs> Which seems weird to me because you would think that he would have a bathroom in his quarters. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you know got what? magic. Why didn't you just like summon one up? Uh, yeah. No, she no. I don't know much about Harry Potter. Yeah, neither do I. You know what? I know a lot about Harry Potter, and sometimes I think that I know too much about Harry Potter, and I am very much at the point in my Harry Potter fandom where there are plenty of things about the books that I really love, and there are so many things about the books that I really hate. But the the my my current standing issue is that JK Rowling continues to follow and like the opinions of trans exclusionary radical feminists online. And I just can't continue to support her work knowing that and also knowing that she not only was very happy to have Johnny Depp in her movies, but she totally doubled down on including him even when people called her out for supporting an abuser after she wrote an entire book series about literally killing your abuser. Yeah, I think I've gone on record on the show as saying fuck Johnny Depp. A mm-hmm. big, big, yeah. big proponent of fuck Johnny Depp. Mm-hmm. Um. You fuck, fuck, fuck. Sorry, I'm, I don't want to get angry right now. I really fucking hate Johnny Depp. Um, especially that, like, now he's trying to turn the t- fucking... All right, wizard shit on the floor. Wizard shit on the floor. Wizard Wizards shit on the do, floor. Wizards the okay. Well, so it's not even that they shit on the floor. It's that they shit in their robes. <laughs> okay, now that's even... Wait, they just poop their pants? <laughs> they just poop. Like, no, that's not... It's not how this works. Welcome to oh our Watchmen episode. You ever know about wizards? They poop in their <laughs> pants. 
You know what? Watchmen is so damn heavy, though, that sometimes you just got to talk about wizards pooping their pants. Yeah, I, I wear I, my wear my poop I, pants right now. I was reading this. I'm like, I can't wait till we start covering happy stories again. Oh no! Oh no! no we're never covering happy stories again. We're going to talk about the Dark Knight Rises. We're going to read um, the Killing Joke. We're just going to read all the sad ones until we burn out. Jokes on you, Dan. We just had a nice interview. <laughs> This is this is a great time, except that we have to talk about the Watchmen. Well, you know. All right. You ready? That happened to be at a dinner party recently. Actually, it's having a great time, and then someone wanted to talk about the Watchmen. Did you Literally. The table? Wait. What? Uh, uh, no, I did leave the table though. Yeah, I think I would. Because he unironically, so he found out that I worked in comic book media, and then he unironically oh. said, "Oh, have you read the Watchmen? I fucking love the Watchmen." And I said, "Cool, I'll be RB," and then I just. Left. That's fair. You know, <laughs> if it That's was like, fair. if someone was like, "Oh, you were like, have you read like Resurrection Man?" No, nobody's gonna say yes. But the fucking Watchmen. It's like there's like two books everyone has seen, read, or touched in their entire lives: the Watchmen and the Bible. There's just two books that are you can't fucking miss. Oh fuck. There's yeah, a lot of people who haven't touched or read a Bible. Well, they've seen it. They know it. <laughs> they've seen it. They've That's seen it in true. stores at the, at the very least, or on yeah. the street corners when people hand them out. Um, right in the when, hotel rooms. When, yeah, that's right. In the doors in the hotel rooms. Um, when Sadie and I were talking about talking points for this episode, she brought up the fact that you know there, there's a huge difference for her between when um, like a white cisgender straight guy says, "Oh, I really love the Watchmen." And when somebody like a woman or a person of color or a queer person says, oh, I really like the Watchmen because it feels like with the former, there's no way to talk about it in any way that's going to be productive and not make you just want to like scream, which I'm glad that this conversation that we're having right now does not make me feel that way. So thanks, guys. Um, but then having the yeah. same conversation with, you know, a marginalized person, it's, it's going to be different because it has to be. Yeah. So there's definitely an, an error of like, okay, so you love the Watchmen. Why do you love the Watchmen? Oh, that guy with the white mask. I love him. He never did anything bad. He doesn't stink. You know who'd shit their pants? Poor Shaq. <laughs> he probably did. All right. Oh, boy. We only got a couple more to go. Let's. All right. Oh, okay. <clears throat> this one is a mouthful. How Dr. Manhattan's gender factors into the role as the omni- uh, omniscient superfigure who is heralded by fanboys for knowing the scope so well that he doesn't care about humanity. Is this justifiable or cool or edgy? Furthermore, would we abide by the same behavior from a woman, non-binary, or gender, c- gender non-conforming person? Would we abide this behavior from a person of color or a queer person? The answer is no. Like, I'm sorry, but if literally anybody other than some white dude turned himself into this all-powerful being and was like, hey, I'm going to make the decisions now, everybody would freaking riot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And his dick is always out. Like, (laughs) Isn't there, it wasn't in the most recent episode of the HBO show, doesn't she have, like, a Dr. Manhattan dildo? Yes. It is. Okay. Which just very much goes back to that that idea of like, oh, you know, he ruined her, but like he literally ruined her. Yeah. And not in like a cool, fun, sexy way or however people yeah. want to think about it. Like he destroyed her life. Yeah. And it, she's in like, so basically they have these quote unquote Dr. Manhattan, Dr. Manhattan confessionals and she tells them this joke and it's like all the fucked up people from her life. Um. And she was incredible in the episode. Like, I love her, but she goes by Lori Blake. Mm. Oh, which is, oh, yuck. Yeah. No. I don't no. Hopefully they talk about why that they made that choice, because that's super fucked up. Um, but yeah, um, that, makes me, uh, uh, that yeah. makes me more uncomfortable. Yeah, everything. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I think his gender absolutely factors in. Um, I really so, wish that you could see the face that I'm making right now. 
I can I can imagine. Uh huh. I'm guessing your brow's a little furrowed and your mouth's a little open and like uh, your eyes are just a little squinty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I, that's the same one I got. Oh, yeah, God, that makes me yeah. that makes me upset. Um, so in the movie, talk about that for a hot second. In the movie, there is no squid. What Ozymandias does is create essentially bombs with Doctor Manhattan's energy and doesn't just drop it on New York. He drops it on like every major city, from my memory. Um, do you think that's more effective or less effective than the alien? Effective how? Um, like, does it does it getting sell? Goals? Like, does it? Hmm. Yeah. How is it effective? Because I think the alien is like it. It provides an absurdist quality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It all. I kind of think it goes kind of with his arrogance a bit because he's like, oh yeah, I got all the like. He didn't just grab all the scientists to do this. He got all the artists to do this, and then he killed them all. Yeah. I think it's more horrific is the alien. Squidly. Because he didn't just, he creates, uh, he created a life just to kill it. Um, I mean, he also mutilated a corpse just to, to bring it life. Yeah. Yeah. I think the movie is pretty, like, almost panel for panel, the comic, but it falls a lot deeper than the comic if that like not that far like it it doesn't have the um it doesn't have anything to say okay so i think this kind of goes so cheryl and eaton was talking about this after dame lindelof's interview and vulture came out a couple weeks ago about how there's this weird propensity for white guys who make movies to feel like they have to impress Alan Moore if they ever want to do anything like useful with their careers. So like Zack Snyder did Watchmen his movie and did it shot for shot, almost the same as the comics, and then tried to like really drive home the ending by changing like this major component of what happens because he was trying to prove that he knew like what was going on. This is obviously me, you know, speculating. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not in Zack Snyder's head. Thank God. Um, but you know, and then Dame Lindelof was like, well, I, I can't, I can't remake it. I can't do that. Like I can't disappoint him like that, but I know that he's going to be disappointed. And I just have to accept that. It's like, who cares? <laughs> yeah. Like who gives a fuck with Alan Moore thinks? Who cares? And not so Grant Morrison, and I understand, I do understand not wanting to mess with a property that is so mired in, like, legal battles over the rights and stuff like that. Like, that that part of it kind of makes sense to me because it's, like, it's very messy and you don't necessarily want to, like, be associated with the messiness of that. But that that doesn't ever seem to be the problem. Like, the problem very much seems to be, like, well, I really wanted to impress Alan Moore, so I did what I thought would impress Alan Moore. And that's just, like you said, that doesn't, it doesn't say anything. That's just empty. Like, what is, what is that? There's no point to that. Mm-hmm. <sighs> but I also will say that I, I don't think the comic says much either. Yeah. I think, <laughs> um... Yeah. The movie had a pretty good soundtrack. I don't even remember the soundtrack to The Watchmen. It had a Desolation Row cover by My Chemical Romance. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they had that music video. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, Uh, I'm looking at the the Wikipedia page for the soundtrack. It was a good soundtrack. The costumes are better, too. But, yeah. The only real costume uh, from the comic that I like is a uh, night owls, uh, like little snow owl costume. Oh, he's so adorable in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the only thing I'm like, yeah, I love that. That's the, the only rest page. Of them, just like, Oh, it's the only page. I was like, Oh, I look at him. Where's little snowsuit. Yeah. <laughs> his little scooter, <laughs> his snow scooter. Oh, you and your little Nazi best friend going to stop the sociopath. Oh, Oh my God. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> Yeah. Fuck. 
<laughs> oh, it looks like there's a collectible figure of him in the snowsuit. Wait, what? Yeah, wait, can you send that to me? Yeah. Thanks. Dancing. I don't know. I typed it in on Google because I had to remember what you were talking about. His little and it brought me to here. <laughs> uh, yes. yes. So remember when you were young and like you would go to the store and they had like a thousand different Batman action figures that were just recolored. Yes. Like, this is his. This is his snowsuit. That's what Night Owl has. Like he yes. had like, a green one and. <laughs> well, how else are you going to blend in? Yeah, I need the green suit for my underwater missions. Right. Or your forest missions. Yeah. Yeah, because the Watchmen are always going into little forest <laughs> missions. <laughs> yeah, the Watchmen are going to burn down the rainforest. What fucked I up mean, shit can we do today? That would surprise me at all. He's got like a, like a, a, a bright orange lead lines owl suit. Well, yeah, that's when he goes over to fight Superman, Jake. Come on. Aren't you reading Doomsday Clock? Just kidding, no one is because he got pushed back. Um, and pushed back and pushed back. Pushed back and pushed back. Back. Push back. And pushed back. You know, we've joked about being a Jeff Johns podcast before because we've read so many of his books because he's he's it's written a lot. a lot of good stuff. But what the fuck? Why are you writing this? Stop. <laughs> like someone just needs to slap your hand and just say stop. And That's leave. why you need cats, because yeah. cats sit on your hands when you've been typing for too long. <laughs> just le- let a bunch of cats loose in John's house. Um, yeah, so I think they're we, all wearing his hats. We have covered um, as much as um, any three humans can. Do you have any final remarks, Sam? Um, I don't think so. I think that the only other thing that I really want to say is that I, th- I think that there. I think that there are a lot of contingents of people who think that Watchmen is significantly more valuable than it is, not only as a comic, um, but also just as a story that has been, you know, adapted and very much heralded as like this, this thing that we should uphold as an ideal. Um, And I don't think that it is that. And I think that it's important that we examine why we're holding it up as an ideal, mm-hmm. which we've just done on this podcast. So thank you. Um, but I also think that it is important to recognize that just because something, whether it be a comic book or a film or whatever other piece of pop culture has somehow made an impact on the way that we tell stories. It does not mean that that story is one that needs to be picked apart again and again and again, looking for meaning. Yeah. And I think, um, we kind of tore it apart more than we, uh, analyzed it, which is good. Um, yeah. yeah so where can, so, all right, before we go, what would you say, if you had to hand somebody a comic to be like, this is what comics are about, what would it be? That's such a tall order. Yeah, I know. I should have asked you at the top of the question. Oh, we also have another question. But if you have any, like, first one that comes to your mind. Like the ideal, like the platonic ideal of a comic? Your ideal. Hmm. I studied philosophy in college, so that my brain goes to the platonic ideal. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think I'm going to get some pushback for this answer. Oh, uh, here we go. But I think... The first thing that comes to mind as a comic that does what I think comics should do is the Fraction Aja Hawkeye run. Okay. Because (laughs) there are just so many elements to that that kind of pull from like different aspects of comics in a way that I think is really interesting. Um, But it's also, it's fun. And I, I love a dark, angsty story. But I do think that comics should be fun, also. Okay. Yeah. Not all, the, not always, but it's like. It's a great uh, balance. Yeah, it's just so good, and like the writing is very tight. The art is great. You know, the character growth is there. Like it does all the things that I want a good story to do, and it does so through the comics medium in a really effective way. 
And then our last question, which should have been our first, um, what's your favorite sandwich? <laughs> oh, that's right. You told me you were going to ask me this. Mm-hmm. So this is extremely specific, like extremely specific. Um, so we lived in Providence for the last few years, and there is a coffee shop called Blue State Coffee, and the one that I used to go to was near the Brown University campus. And they have this sandwich. I'm going to look up the name of it so I can give you, like, all the details. Okay, it's literally just called the balsamic roasted tofu sandwich. So it's literally balsamic roasted tofu and then pesto and then this tomato chutney that they make. And I would get it hot on this olive rosemary bread. And it is perfect. It's the perfect sandwich. Like, it's just so delicious. And then we constantly have tried to remake it at home, and we've done okay with it, but it's it's just not the same as getting it at that actual coffee shop. Hmm. I love how specific everyone, like most people, get with their sandwiches. I will say that originally, when Dan told me that he was going to ask me this, my first thought was like, well, grilled cheese, obviously. And then I was like, no. <laughs> no, it's this one specific sandwich from this local coffee shop in Providence. Sounds incredible. Yeah, I, I love, I really like, I think you may be the first person to give us a specific sandwich, like where you can get it. Yeah, the Blue State Coffee is actually, I think it's a, it's a, like a small chain. Mm-hmm. I know that there's one in Boston, uh, and I think there may be a couple others. So if you're in New England, you can have that sandwich. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, where can people find you? on the interwebs uh i'm the verbal thing literally everywhere i'm the verbal thing on twitter instagram um i have a facebook page and then as i mentioned at the top of the recording i am the managing editor at the beat so you can find the majority of my current writing on comicsbeat.com and then i also do some like freelancing stuff um which i usually will link on my social medias you can find us at DC Super Sons on Twitter, Super Sons Pod on Insta, our website is supersonspod.com. Um, support us at patreon.com slash supersons. Sam, thank you so much for coming on. Thank um, you for having means me. It means a lot to us. We're trying to um, get as many perspectives out into the world and as signal boosted as we can um, because there are a million other uh, two dude podcasts talking about Watchmen. And that is all we've got. 